As moms, we have so many analogies to choose from. We're walking a balance beam while wearing a big stack of hats, juggling balls with one hand, and holding a teetering scale in the other hand. But Monica Tanner gave me new insight into this balancing act. Marriage is hard. Motherhood is hard. And then you throw in this like message that's inside of me that I want to get out to the masses and becoming an entrepreneur and all the things that that entails. Right. And so balancing all of that, I always say balance is a journey, not a destination. Like the very word balance denotes that it's not stable. It's always in flux. And so I think that we're always learning how to manage these very important aspects of ourselves, you know, our marriage, being a mother, and and getting our message out. This is the How She Moms podcast with Whitney Archibald. I'm a mother of five on a mission to help moms connect with your kids, manage your homes, and create your own unique version of motherhood. I curate ideas from different moms so you can pick and choose what works for you and your family. Monica Tanner is passionate about marriages and families and, well, passion itself. In fact, she's made a career of it. She started a company called On the Brighter Side of Marriage to combine marriage and business coaching. I help passionate female entrepreneurs prioritize their marriage so that they can crush their business goals. I think that we're always learning how to manage these very important aspects of ourselves, you know, our marriage, being a mother, and, and getting our message out, right? Those are all really, really important parts of who I am and learning how to balance those is an ongoing process. Yeah, so um, I've, I've developed a actually a four pillar process. So the base is kind of this healthy sexuality. And then the four pillars are courage, confidence, communication, and connection. So those are the four ways that that kind of plays out and the things that we're balancing and at the top. So what sits on those four pillars are a strong marriage, a supportive family and a successful business. In this episode, we're going to talk to Monica about how she prioritizes marriage, family and work in that order. I would say I'm a wife first, stay at home mom second and, you know, aspiring successful businesswoman third. So it will probably always go in that order. I think the very most important thing that you could ever do for your children is to love their dad, right? Like I, I just don't think there's anything better. And I don't even think that you have to hide your arguments and your disagreements and things like that, because many, many, many times my children have seen that my husband and I are very different humans, that we have different ideas about how things should be done or different opinions. And, and, but at the end of the day, we love each other and we support each other beyond anything else. And I think I truly feel that that is the best thing that we can do for our kids in so many ways. It's the way we look at each other. It's the way we, you know, kiss in the pantry. It's the way that we prioritize date night. And, you know, we have quiet time on Sundays. That's just for us. Like, that the fact that our kids see us prioritizing that just creates this really safe environment. And the fact that they see us disagree and then reconcile, they can see that it's okay to not be perfect. It's okay to make mistakes. It's okay to disagree. So I think that's really, really important. And as far as like tangible takeaways and tangible tips, I know, especially for young moms, it's really hard to, you know, you've got this helpless human that you're now in charge of, right? And and then you've got your spouse who is an adult and can take care of themselves. And so it's really hard to prioritize your marriage over this totally helpless little being that you're like the only one that can keep them alive. And so I think starting from the moment you become a mom to when your kids leave the house, I think prioritizing your marriage by making time, prioritizing time, energy, and space for your spouse is the most important thing you can do for your kids. Well, and we, you know, we all acknowledge that our goal is to raise functional, healthy adults. And one of the best things we can do is to model a healthy relationship 
Absolutely. I mean, it's funny because I have a bunch of teenagers at home right now. And my husband and I have always been very affectionate with each other. Like we don't hide our affection. Like we'll smooch in front of everybody. Like it's totally fine. Right. When my kids were young, they would smile and, you know, they wanted to join in the hug and, you know, all of those things. Right. Now that they're teenagers, we get a lot of eye rolling, a lot of like, get a room, you know, like it's kind of embarrassing for them. But I know that deep down inside, they love it. It gives them a sense of security to know that the two humans that are, you know, in charge of them love each other and kiss and go on dates and do all the things, right? And so, yeah, absolutely. Like, what do I want for my kids when they grow up? To have a relationship just like mine. Like, that's, I, you know, I want them to be, happy contributing humans in society. And I truly do feel that the, the most important piece of that is to have a happy home life is to be able to share your life with somebody that you absolutely adore. And so that's how we do it. That's awesome. So can you give me some specific examples of just ways that you prioritize your marriage and ways that you show your demonstrate that to your kids? Um, I teach my students a lot about daily connections. I think daily connections are really important. There are 1,440 minutes in a day. And I say you should spend 10 to 20 of those minutes talking to each other about your inner worlds, basically. So that's a concept that comes from John Gottman. But it's not like, what did you do today? It's like, how did you feel today? Like, what are the emotions you experienced today? Like, what are you really looking forward to? What, what is making you nervous? Is there something that was difficult for you today? What can I do to make your life easier going forward? Like those types of question and answer sessions should be non-negotiable every single day. So whether that's like first thing in the morning, which works really great for my husband and I, we both kind of pop up early and we, we, kind of have our daily connection in the morning before the day starts. Um, but you could go for a walk after dinner. You could do it after the kids are in bed. Uh, but I, I feel like these are non-negotiable. And then after you ask each other these questions, I always advise that you use some form of physical affection to kind of seal it. So a kiss, a hug, a back rub, you know, some physical um, sign that you've connected. Um, So those are daily, um, daily connections. I think those are really important being at the crossroads. It's so important to be at the crossroads for your spouse, like for your kids, but also for your spouse. So I love greeting my husband at the door, like a golden retriever. I mean, I don't, I'm not a dog person, but the idea that I'm so happy when my spouse gets home, I mean, I will stop what I'm doing. I will run to greet him. I will give him kisses on his face. Like I'm so excited that he's here with us. Right. And so no matter what his day was like, but then, so that's twofold. So I'm very, very always happy to see him. I think that he would be like worried if, if like several days went by and I didn't greet him at the door. Cause I always have done that. So I love it when my husband gets home from work whether he's at work or he was running errands or he was driving kids around wherever, like I, I love when he comes home. Um, but I also think it's really important to give him time and space to acclimate to our house before I start bombarding him with questions like, how was your day? We have a problem with the sink or, you know, all of these different like things that are part of family life, like so-and-so needs to be taken to soccer practice or, you know, these things. So I, I love to greet him into a safe and happy place and then give him time to kind of acclimate and, you know, brush off the, the world before I start in with all of like the technical aspects of family life. Um, not taking for granted the little things I think is really important. So I think it's so bonding to see your spouse be a really good parent. And so, you know, thanking them and, and acknowledging them for, you know, playing trucks on the floor with your, with your toddler or, you know, laying, laying in bed at night with your teenagers or, or whatever you see them doing that that's, you know, parenting in an extraordinary way. I always love to, you know, sometimes I'll take a picture or, you know, sometimes I'll just like poke my head in the room when he's, you know, laying with my girls and putting them to bed at night. I'll just kind of 
pop my head in the room and like give a wink or something, you know, like I just, I love to acknowledge the things that he does for our family that just really pull my heartstrings when he's doing the dishes. I almost always will go back behind him and pinch his butt. Like it's my favorite thing. Like I love that he does the dishes for our family. It's not something that I expect him to do, but it's something I'm so grateful that he just jumps in and does. So I'll give him a pinch on the butt to say, thank you. So, you know, take, not taking those little things, those little daily things for granted. And then I think the last tip that I think is really important is to always be dreaming and planning together. I mean, this is your life. You you have the opportunity to create this beautiful life with this other human. And even though you might not prioritize all the things exactly the same, it's so important to have this shared dream, this shared vision, and to share with them your priorities. For example, I spend a lot of time on my business because I love it. I'm so passionate about it. Right. And every once in a while, I need a little reminder, like a little kick in the pants, like, Hey, remember you have this family that also needs you and, you know, wants you to just watch a a movie. Like I'm a terrible movie watcher. My kids will like sit down and watch a movie and I'm like, Oh, they don't need me for this. Like I'll go work in my office or something. Right. And you know, my husband sometimes will be like, it's not just like watching a movie. It's like just being with us and they're present and close to us. And I'm like, Oh, see, I have to be reminded of those things. So, you know, having that, that shared dream and vision, like when I look back, you know, my kids look back on their childhood. I don't want them to think mom was never there when we were just hanging out. So, um, so even though I don't find those things to be super, super important, it's like nice that he knows what my dreams and my visions are and can remind me of those things that sometimes I overlook. So, so dream and plan together is also so very important. I teach this to my entrepreneurs that I, that I work with. I teach them so much. I'm like, stop trying to rate your marriage on whether or not your spouse shares your passions. Online marketing is not my husband's thing. Talking about sexuality on the internet is not my husband's thing, right? He's not passionate about those things. I am, but he's passionate about me. And so there's a huge distinction there when we stop trying to make them, we don't have to make our dreams, each other's dreams. We just have to like love them and share them. So like my passion is not his passion but I'm his passion. And so, you know, we can have these separate goals that support each other in like a, such a beautiful, magnificent way. Like he doesn't love talking and sharing feelings, but I do. So, you know, everybody gets what they want. Like he listens to me as I like ramble on about wanting to speak on stages and do all these things that would never excite him in any way. Right. But then I, that's how I connect. And that's how I feel close to him. Right. When he listens to me dream my big dreams, but he feels close to me in a different way. He's an expert on how I feel connection and I'm an expert on how he feels connection. So as he supports me in my dreams, even though they're not his dreams, I support him in his. So I think it's really important to become an expert on how you feel connection because it's different women and men and women and husbands and wives and coming from different backgrounds, you feel connected to each other in a different way. And so I always say, become an expert on how you feel connected and become an expert on how your spouse feels connected. And then make sure that you're aware of those things. That discussion launched us into the hot topic of how we divide labor in our homes. Like he knew when he married me that I wasn't the type of girl that was going to have dinner hot and ready for him when he got home and, you know, cookies for dessert every night. Like that's not my jam. So I think that when it comes to figuring out your needs and, and, and what works for you and your family, there's no like division of labor that, that is going to work for everybody. Like you have to just figure out what works for you. Like, my husband eats to sustain life. It's not like he loves food. So it works great that often nights he's making grilled cheese for the kids, like maybe three times a week. Right. So it's like, it keeps him alive and he's totally fine with it, but I'm always going to greet him at the door. So it just depends on what's important to you. What makes you feel loved? What, what makes you feel like a safe sense of of security and acceptance, tolerance and love in your own family. So I would say that, you know, an equal division of labor isn't the goal. It's that 
everybody feels loved and cared for and, and, and important in your family. It's, it's really important to know what each other values, just, uh, just as important as it to know how you feel connected to your spouse, right? And so it takes time to get to know that about somebody else. But if you prioritize that, if you make it a priority to know, how do you feel connected to me? How do you feel valued? What are your values? What are your dreams and goals for our family? Just knowing all of those things. And then I'm not a big proponent about talking about your past and all of your like, you know, wounds and things like that. But I am a big proponent of like learning about my husband and, and how he was raised and what he thought about that and how that affected him and the things that were important in his family growing up. And, you know, so there's a whole lot of juggling going on. Like when you choose to you know, mesh your life with another human who's had different experiences. And the way he grew up is I would say like, couldn't possibly be more different than the way that I grew up. Right. I mean, it's like 180 degrees, but opposites attract, right. And there's a reason why he was attracted to me. And so it's just a matter of understanding him. Conflict is not bad to me. I think conflict is amazing. I think conflict is what breeds passion in a marriage and in a life. So if you're trying to like always compromise or like keep the peace in your family, I think you're doing a huge disservice to your marriage. So conflict is good, but a lot of times understanding more, less the words and more where the conflict is coming from is really valuable. So I always say when you add curiosity to vulnerability, you get creativity. So whenever there's a conflict, it means two people are looking at something from a different way. But if you stop and get really curious, like, why do you see it this way? How did you get to this idea of this? How is this affecting you, right? When you get really curious and you allow for vulnerability, so I can be vulnerable about how I feel about this, and I'm allowing you to be vulnerable about how you feel about this, then you can come up with this creative solution that's way better than a compromise. I hate that word compromise. I feel like nobody wins in a compromise. I'm giving up something, you're giving up something. We're both unhappy with the result. But when you add curiosity to vulnerability, you can always come up with something creative that works amazing for both of you. Like it is possible. So I think everybody should get what they want and need out of a marriage. It, like there's no reason for compromise. There's no reason for an equal division of labor. It's just like, what's important to you? What's important to your spouse? Create this dynamic in your family that is good for everybody. Now let's talk about Monica's other two priorities, her kids and her work, and how they impact each other. We'll start with her early career decisions. For background here, Monica converted to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in college. I like, I really didn't know any other way besides I thought moms worked. Like, you know, I thought every mom worked. I didn't know any moms that didn't have jobs, right? So when I joined the church and there's like all this, like, you know, being a stay-at-home mom, I was like, oh my gosh, that's an option. Like I changed my major immediately. Like I wanted to be a pediatrician because I was like if I was a pediatrician then I could work with kids and I could have semi flexible schedule and so like that's I was like my goal was to go to med school um, and become a pediatrician but anyways after I joined the church I'm like wait there's an option to be a stay-at-home mom like I can just be at home with my kids and I was like yeah sign me up for that so I changed my major to sociology and child development and that was kind of my plan as I would stay home with my kids I worked up until I had Jake. I was wow. um, the manager. I managed a daycare. So I worked right up until I had Jake and it actually worked even after I had Jake. I just took him to work with me. So I worked all the way through when Ben graduated and then I stayed at home with Jake, but I really helped Ben with his business. I've always kind of really worked because uh -huh. Ben started his own business, but I was like a very integral part of that. Like we, we worked together to build this business. So I always kind of worked, but after I had my third baby, I was like, I can't, I got to pull myself out of the business. Like it was too much. Like I was doing the books and the finances and, um, accounting. And I was doing like so much for his business 
then I had this new baby, a toddler and a two year old. Right. So I was like, I can't do this anymore. <laughs> um, so I was like a real stay at home mom for, you know, a few years, didn't do anything, but I, I had this itch. Like I was like, I got to do something. So after my fourth was a little bit older and started school, I was like, I'm, I'm ready to like find my thing, like do my thing. Monica is a great example of how we often think we have two choices, working mom or stay at home mom. But the reality is that a growing number of moms like Monica are more of a hybrid of the two. Yeah. So I've always thought of myself as a stay at home mom. And even though I have this, you know, entrepreneurial dream that I have, I still consider myself a stay at home mom. I mean, I love what I do because I do it from home. You know, I'm still very active and involved in my family and and my kids and what they're doing. And so I think I'll always, no matter how, you know, successful I ever get, right. I'll always consider myself a stay at home mom because that's what I am first. But one thing that I, um, that I missed growing up, like something that I didn't have growing up that I learned about in my later years and then vowed to do in my life in my own like motherhood was to be at the crossroads. And so I know there's lots of different situations and moms that do lots of different things. But for me, one of the most important things that I've been able to do in my motherhood is to be at the crossroads, meaning when my kids leave, when my kids come home, both from school or from being out at their activities, I always like to be like associated with our home and a soft place for them to land when they've been out in the world and they come back. And that's not just my children, it's my husband as well. I think it's so important to be, you know, a representative of, of a place that's, that's peaceful and calm and accepting and loving and, you know, a place, uh, like I said, a soft place to land when they've been out in the world. And so being a stay at home mom is my jam. Like I love being a stay at home mom. I also love my passion for helping couples and my business and things like that, but I'm so grateful I get to do that. That is not to say that being a stay at home mom has always been easy for Monica. But for me, like the child bearing and the young, you know, baby toddler years were really, really difficult for me because I actually loved being pregnant and had lots of energy being pregnant. It was like the whole transition of my body and the hormones and all of this added responsibility after I had a baby that always threw me for a loop. Yeah. <laughs> like I just wasn't very good at the first, you know, few years of motherhood because like, of course it's this magical bonding time. And I loved my babies so much but it was very hard for me to be needed in that way. Like, like the sleepless nights and the bodily fluids and having to pack around all the snacks and like find all the shoes and like have this massive bag with all the things. I just wasn't really very good at that part. I think (laughs) until my kids started to gain little personalities and they could tell me what they wanted. We could have conversations and it was, you know, time to, kind of really teach them. So the whole like caretaking part of motherhood, like where they couldn't really tell me what they needed. It was just a matter of like keeping them alive. I don't think I was very good at that. And I didn't really love it. I just, I felt tired all the time. And I I felt like I was just picking up noodles off the floor and there has to be more to life than this. And I just, that wasn't what I was made for. But now as my kids are older and they have these great personalities and they're very independent, probably partially because I wasn't like that doting mom that did all the things for them. And so I accidentally created these very independent humans, which was awesome because I love to watch them grow and learn things and be independent and solve their own problems. And like being, being a mom of older kids is like my jam. I love it. (laughs) To generalize here, there are a few big pivot points in a mom's career path. One is high school graduation and or college when we're deciding what we really want to be when we grow up. The next is often when we become a mom and have to reevaluate our career based on this new part of our identity. And then this stage that Monica is talking about when our youngest child goes to school is probably the third pivot point. I asked Monica how she recognized and decided to follow her passion for helping marriages. 
Yeah. So I think it's been a really long process to get to where I am today. So my parents divorced when I was 12, obviously kind of rocked my whole world. And at that moment was when I was like, like, I became obsessed with like marriage and what makes marriages and families strong and, and lasting, right? And, and, and then when I went to college, I studied sociology and child development with, my, with the idea that I would graduate and get my master's in social work and work with families. Okay. Um, but then I got married instead, right? And I started my family and got really into family life and all of that. But then when my youngest went to kindergarten, I decided to go back to school to get my um, <clears throat> marriage and family counseling license. And so I applied to programs. I found the best one in the area and I got three semesters in and I literally would come home from class crying every single day. I was like, this isn't right. It just doesn't feel right. This isn't what I want to do. I knew I wanted to help families in, in, in the area of marriage, but I just... I just couldn't wrap my head around counseling. I was like, I don't want to do therapy. I don't want to work just one-on-one -on -one with couples. Like I want to prevent couples from getting to the counseling office. Like, I feel like I have so much inside of me, so much to share, but I don't want to wait until they're in crisis and they're in therapy. And so um, I, I quit that graduate program. It was a really difficult decision, but I was so miserable. And so I quit and I got really depressed. I was like, I have this message inside of me. I want to share, but who's ever going to listen to me? I don't have any letters behind my name. Like, why would anyone listen to me? Um, and I had this neighbor who's an incredible businessman, father of five, just incredible man. And he came to check on our family and he was like, you should start a podcast. You have a message that you want to share. And he's like, you should be doing that. You should be sharing your message through a podcast. And I was like, I don't know how. And he's like, well, I'm going to, I'll teach you. Right. So he'd had a podcast for years. So he sent me an email and it had all the steps I needed to take. And wow. literally a month later on the brighter side was born. And so I started this podcast and it was just like a total experiment. And it was this amazing platform where I found my voice and I figured out who I wanted to speak to and how I could help them. And and my business has kind of grown out of that. And it's just been a really cool process. I love how Monica just passionately jumps into everything she does with both feet and embraces the messiness that comes along with marriage, family, and work. I want to end with Monica's message of grace. Well, part of it is just having a lot of compassion for myself and just understanding like it's not a prerequisite to love all the stages. Like you can still raise fantastic, phenomenal kids, which I, I mean, I'm a little biased, but I think my kids are amazing, right? But I didn't love all the stages and I really screwed up a lot. <laughs> like I just wasn't the perfect mother. Like I remember, you know, this one situation where, you know, we went on this, we went on this hike and it was like several of us mothers, right? And we all like had multiple children and we went on this really fun hike to a waterfall. And like all these moms, they had, you know, the, the picnic blanket to sit on and they had you know, all the snacks and for the lunch and the towels for all the kids, they had, they were like these pack mules. And I like was so happy that I just made it there with my kids. And so we get to the end and I realize I'm like, oh my gosh, I have no snacks for these people. I didn't have water for them and I didn't bring any towels. So I have these dripping wet kids <laughs> <laughs> and I hadn't brought any of the things. I just hadn't thought about it. I was like, I got myself here. I got my kids here. Like we're ready to have a great time. I didn't pack all the things. And these beautiful mothers, these friends of mine, they all put their arms around me, right? They didn't let my kids freeze you know, and drip dry, like they shared their towels, they shared their snacks. And like, I learned a great lesson that, that day that like, we can all kind of pick up the slack for each other and we can all have a lot of compassion and, and as we learn and nobody's perfect. Right. And it's okay. Like, it's okay to not have it all together all the time. So, um, I think through the different phases of motherhood, I've just learned to have a lot of patience with myself and just be like, I'm, I'm just learning. I've never done this before. Like, we're going to make mistakes and, and, and I'm probably going to screw up my kids in some way. But, but one thing I know I'm getting right is my kids know that I fiercely love their dad and that no matter what, I will always back him and have this undying love for him. And so I know as I like 
you know, make my missteps in motherhood and, you know, they, they make their mistakes, they'll know that our house is filled with love, that even though we make mistakes and even though we're imperfect and, you know, even though we disagree about things or do things differently, that, that we all just love each other. And this is just a safe place to come and grow and be and learn. Thank you for listening to the How She Moms podcast. If you like it, tell a friend. The bigger the community, the more ideas. There are lots of ways you can add your ideas to the How She Moms community. We have a Facebook group where we share ideas about upcoming topics and help each other solve problems we're facing in motherhood. You can also follow How She Moms on Instagram for quick tips and ideas. And you can go to howshemoms.com where you'll find transcripts of episodes and lots of other great resources. Special thanks to my mom, Susan Singley, for recording my theme music. She played this song all the time when I was growing up, and to me, it's the soundtrack of motherhood.